just to remind you what we've been doing, uh, so far in this middle sections of the course, I've been identifying particular types of information, such as texture, linear perspective, um, shading. Uh, we've been analyzing what are the models that exist to try and describe how it is that we're able to derive any information from those different sources. And we're going to do the same thing today. So everything we've covered so far, uh, those sources of information have been around since the <coughs> Italian Renaissance. So linear perspective obviously uh, invented in the 15th century. Um, Chiaroscuro, uh, similar vintage. Uh, texture is a little bit n newer, but it's, it's basically a generalization of linear perspective. So today, um, we're going to cover one of the more, one of the first modern discoveries of a new source of 3D information that wasn't around 500 years ago. And in particular, it involves um, the use of motion to know about 3D shape. So let me show you uh, an example of this. Um, who shall I pick on? Let's pick on you this time. Tell me what you see up there. A triangle and a like trapezoid with an extra line at the bottom. Does it look 3D at all? No, it looks 2D. Just looks 2D. Do you all agree? Anybody see a 3D thing in here? Well, let's get it going in motion. How's it look now? Does it look like a 3D object? All right, this phenomenon was discovered in 1957 by Hans Wallach. Remember, we heard about him before when we talked about lightness perception. Uh, well, Wallach was also the first person to discover this effect, and he referred to it as the kinetic depth effect. Now, back in 1957, they didn't have computer graphics. They couldn't do experiments the way that we do them now. And so the way he was able to do this, he had a, uh, a turntable, remember those? Um, and he would take a bent wire coat hanger and put it on the turntable. And then he had a translucent screen between the observer and the turntable. And it would shine light uh, on the turntable side of the screen and the, um, the bent wire coat hanger would form a shadow. And so the observers would watch the shadow and when it was stationary, they'd say, oh, it just looks like a random 2D set of lines, just like you did. But then as soon as the motion started, then they would say, oh, it looks like a three-dimensional object. Right? So this was a new source of information in 1957. Uh, the study of it took about another 20 years, and I'll lay out the gory story of structure uh, for motion as we go along. Let me show you one other example of this that I think works a bit better. What do you see here? Uh, just, uh, like a barcode kind of image type thing, the scan. If I told you you were looking at a 3D surface, would you believe me? Can anybody see a 3D surface in here? Well, let's see if I can change that. And all I have to do is make it move. And out it pops. Now, the cool thing is when I stop it, it fades back into nothing <laughs> until I started again. I gave a talk years ago um, where I put the titles, instead of having random dots on there, I had the title of my talk and the author and my institution, and it just looked like a regular old title page. And then I hit the button and the thing started rotating like that and you could see the, um, the surface. And uh, I got applauded. So it was the first time in my life I was ever applauded for my title page. <laughs> but um, 
that that's the effect. So this is this is a really good example of the kinetic depth effect. Here we've eliminated all other sources of information. It's just the motion uh, that's doing it. Oh, by the way, I should apologize. The the version of this lecture I put on Carmen doesn't have any videos in it. Uh, the reason for that is with the videos embedded, it, it's almost 100 megabytes. So your computer probably wouldn't like downloading it, and uh, so I, I didn't include them. All right, so we go from 1957 to uh, 1979, where the next big discovery happened uh, by a graduate student at MIT, a guy by the name of Shimon Ullman. Ullman's an interesting guy. He's a Israeli fighter jet pilot. Uh, went to um, went to MIT, and he decided to do his thesis on this problem, on structure for motion. And in doing so, he was able to prove a theorem, which is described here, from a sequence of orthographic projections of a rigid object rotating in depth. It's possible to compute the 3D structure of an object up to a reflection in depth. Right, so what he's doing here is he's developing a computational model where you take a, a series of still images and you measure the positions uh, of the points in each image. And then he sets up a set of simultaneous equations that he's able to solve and calculate the um, 3D coordinates of each point in the scene. Uh, now, there are a couple of uh, limitations of this. This computation requires a minimum of three distinct views. In fact, Ullman was able, able to prove that if you don't have at least three different views, then it's mathematically impossible uh, to derive the 3D structure from just two views. You have to have three. And you also have to have four non-coplanar points. The important one I want to focus on is this three distinct views, as we'll spend a lot of time talking about that today. Now, this paper came out, uh, as I said, 1979 is when his thesis was published, and um, it had a big impact on the field. So there were lots of groups around the world uh, who said, yeah, let's do some empirical research on this. And the way to think about this, you can think about it as what's called an ideal observer model. So this, Ullman's model is telling you the best you can do in principle. So if you assume that I, the accuracy I can measure the points in an image is perfect, and I have unlimited computational power of the brain, uh, this is the absolute best performance you can do. So under those circumstances, you can calculate the metric structure in just three views. But the general view at the time was people probably aren't that all that efficient, right? So it would be reasonable to expect that people, real people would be somewhat worse than that. So, right, you might have a buildup of their accuracy as you add more views say going from two to eight or what have you. And um, there were a bunch of groups around the world who were studying this question. So they started manipulating the number of views and um, seeing how performance changed when they did that. And one of those groups was me. I was a young assistant professor back then. And um, uh, so I was one of the groups that was doing these experiments. The one thing I did that was different from all the other experiments is I included a condition with only two views. All right, now remember, the theory says that with just two views, it should be impossible to make judgments about 3D structure. You have to have at least three. That, that's, a, that's a mathematical proof. And so uh, here's the first experiment I did. I'll show you, these are some of the stimuli. So what you're gonna see is a bunch of dots and two lines, one that points upward and one that points downward. And your job on each trial is to speak out 
Which one is longer, the one that points upward or the one that points downward? Is that clear? All right, let's see how this works. So which one is longer, the top or the bottom? The, the two solid lines are the ones you're drawing, judging. Here's another example. Top one or bottom? You're right. Top or bottom? Pretty good. Now here's the two view case. Top or bottom? Does it look any less 3D than the others? Here's another two view case. So here are the results I got from this experiment. If you, this is the percentage correct, so there were two different length ratios. So in one, the longer object was 30% longer than the shorter one. And there was another condition where it was only 10% longer than the shorter one. By the way, just to give you a sense of context, if you're judging the length of two lines in the frontal parallel plane, you can detect a difference of 1%. So, uh, first, right off the bat, subjects aren't particularly accurate at this, so threshold is right around 10%, which is 10 times worse than length of a line in the frontal parallel plane. But the main thing that pops off this page is there's no effective number of views. You're as good as you're going to get with just two views. So what does this tell us? Anybody want to venture a guess? Sure. Does your brain predict the other views? I'm sorry? Does your brain predict the other views necessary to put them together? Um, how would it do that prediction? Well, your brain's doing something, obviously. Uh, what does it tell us about Ullman's model? It's not right. Uh, it's not right. We don't need three views. But remember, Ullman proved mathematically, and other people have gone over the proof, I mean, it's a correct proof, that you cannot determine the metric structure from just two views. It's not mathematically possible. So either we're really good guessers, um, or something else is going on. So what do you do when you're, in a, you're a young researcher and you're in a situation like this, you've got some data, the data make absolutely no sense whatsoever. I've described many experiments like this so far in the course like this. What's my standard response in that situation? Put it in a drawer. Put it in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, in this case, I didn't actually put it in a drawer. I said, I, I don't, we'll run other variants of it just to convince myself that it's true. And uh, so here's the, here's the next example. So in this one, uh, here, what you have to do is judge the, the depth to width ratio of these uh, corrugated ridges here. So how much is the depth from the deepest point to the nearest point relative to how far apart the ridges are from each other? So this one, they look about equal to me. Here's the two view case. And again, the three-dimensional structure uh, is pretty clear here. Here are the results of the data. And again, with one exception, maybe right here, uh, the number of frames, so this is the judged amplitude to period ratio. This is what it actually is being depicted. You see the subjects are, under, are overestimating the depth. Uh, but the number of frames doesn't have much of an effect at all, and you do, essentially, you're as good with two views as you are with more than two views. So this is violating everybody's expectations. Again, the idea was people didn't expect you'd be 
as good as you're going to be with three, uh, but probably would require something a little bit more than that. And what my data are telling me is, no, you're as good as you're ever going to get with just two views. This is when we put it in the drawer. Um, so what are we going to do with this? Uh, the main conclusion you can come with is wh whatever it is they're doing, they're not judging metric structure. Because metrics, but the task is a metric structure task. So we're asking them to compare links in different directions. So they're not all that accurate, whatever they're doing. Uh, but they're clearly not using Ullman's model. And so I'm wrestling with this, I'm wrestling with this, I'm wrestling with this. And then I said, well, let's change the problem a little bit. Rather than ask the question, how many views do I need to calculate metric structure? I'll change the question to, what can I calculate from two views? That altered question. So I know whatever observers are doing, they're, they're doing it with two views. And so now I'm going to ask the question, all right, well, what, what can I get from, from two views? And it turns out Ullman had actually studied that case. And um, he published it in his thesis, but he didn't publish it in the, in the officially published version of the thesis that actually went out to a journal. And um, so here's what Allman did. It's a very clever analysis. Um, there's a famous proof by a mathematician, a guy by the name of Euler, uh, where what Euler showed is, is you can take a rotation about any axis, like so, and you can decompose it into a rotation about any two other axes that you mix together. You've heard of this theorem before? Oh, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah. All right. So what Ullman says is, well, all right, let's be, let's pick our two axes carefully. So the, say the object's doing this. And we're going to say, all right, well, imagine now it's, what it's really doing is rotating about the, uh, an axis in the image plane, followed by a rotation about the line of sight. And you know from Euler's theorem that you can copy any 3D rotation by going through that exercise. And the selection of these two axes is not by accident because this one, everything's happening in the image plane and it's possible to undo it. That's the key. So here's how that works. So let's say I've got uh, points in frame one which are black and points in frame two which are white um, and we're going to align two of the points with each other right here and what the theorem says is you can take rotate the black points so that uh, you can make all the trajectories be parallel to one another so whenever you have a rigid motion this is going to be possible Right? You can rotate one image relative to the other in the image plane. And so you can train something like this to this. And you can do this algebraically in a pretty simple way. I mean, I'm just trying to give you the insight of it. it, it it's not a very hard computation. Uh, but the idea by doing that, you do two things. A, you test whether a rigid solution is even possible or not. Um, and the other thing it does is he proved from this situation that in this case, there's a one parameter family of solutions. Um, so whereas in the three view case, you get a unique solution. In the two view case, you get a, a one parameter family. And I'll try and explain how that works in a second. So let's say I'm an observer, I'm looking at this point, rotating about an axis like so. Um, we can describe the rotation using these. Now, I don't necessarily want you to understand the math, except at the final step. So we can describe rotation using these parametric equations. And if we do a little bit of elementary calculus, we can convert this into that. So what this is saying is z, the depth of a point at some moment in time, 
equals dx dt, which is the image plane velocity that you can measure um, at some point in time, divided by omega, and omega is the angular velocity. So I'm trying to determine z. I can measure dx dt, but I have no idea what omega is. So this is the parameter that gives you the, the family of interpretations. So the idea is um, if you take two shapes, um, so right, if I'm rotating my head like so, uh, I could be Professor Todd with a normal head rotating at that speed, or I could be uh, artificial Professor Todd with a squashed head rotating at a much faster rate. Both of those would produce exactly the same instantaneous flow fields. You, you can't tell them apart in principle. So here's the idea. You've done a transformation now from x, y, z. That's the coordinates in the 3D environment. And you've mapped it on to x prime, y prime, which are the coordinates in the image. And then the z term is determined by this dx dt omega, right? So basically, x, y, z maps on to x prime, y prime image velocity. And there's a single free parameter omega that scales everything uh, up and down in depth. Now the other thing to note here is note the image velocity field is an affine transformation of the surface depth field with an unknown scaling constant. So basically uh, you're getting the full-blown shape perfectly from the motion, but the object could be stretched or compressed in depth, all consistent with the same motion information. Now again, this is just from two views. You had a third view, you can calculate the structure exactly but the data suggests that humans, for whatever reason, are unable to do that. So metric properties include relations among distance intervals in different directions. So the the theorem I just or the the theory I just gave you, the two view model, says this kind of judgment should be really hard because it's not specified. It's not invariant over the affine transformation. Um, however, if you ask people um, to make judgments about in parallel directions, they should be really good at it because this type of relationship is preserved over affine transformation. So you have this one parameter family of interpretations all related by an affine transformation. So some things are going to be common to all those interpretations. Some things will vary among those different interpretations. So all the affine properties are going to be the same, and all the metric properties are going to be different. So this theory says affine properties you should be able to judge fine. Metric properties you should have problems with. Now both of the previous tasks I showed you were metric tasks, and subjects were not particularly good at it. Let's consider now an affine task. Again, you don't need to understand the math here. Um, just take my word for it. Uh, one of the things you can judge, which is an affine property, is planarity. So suppose you look at a rotating pattern of lines. And your job is to say, is that pattern a planar pattern, or is it non-planar? All right, planarity is an affine property because you can stretch, linearly stretch an object any way you want, and the plane will always be a plane. You'll never alter that aspect of it. And so the two-view model predicts that people ought to be really good at judging whether a configuration is planar or not. So here's an example of that. Now you have to judge which of these configurations is planar, the one on the top or the one on the bottom. Which is it? Bottom it is. 
Which configuration is planar? One on the top or one on the bottom? And you're right. Which is planar, top or bottom? And you're right again. Now let's do it with two views. Top or bottom? This feels a lot easier than the other, doesn't it? Top or bottom? So let's look at the result from this. Now the way we did this is we, we started with a bunch of lines that were all in the plane and then we rotated one of the lines out by just a little bit, either two or four degrees. So we're talking fairly small deviations from planar. And these are the results. Um, at four degrees, uh, subjects are 90% accurate. They're really good at this. Uh, two degrees, you know, they're down around 70%. This is usually where a threshold would be defined. Uh, and again, not much effect with number of frames. So this is very consistent with the two-frame affine model. All right, so the affine model says affine properties we should be really good at, metric properties we should be really bad at, and the number of views shouldn't matter. And both of those are preserved over the experimental data. Now I have to say when I publish this paper, this I was shocked by how um, controversial it was. The nobody wanted to hear anything about affine geometry back in those days. It just wasn't something that psychologists um, uh, were ever concerned about. And so much to my shock, uh, I went to a conference in Germany and I was presenting this. So the first time I presented this, I was pretty nervous. And I went to Germany and presented it for this, and I got a lot of grief at the conference, so my nervousness was well founded. <laughs> and um, the, uh, so a couple of weeks later, I went off to Germany and gave a presentation on this. But the talk before mine was a name you've heard many times in this course was Jan Kunderink. And to my amazement, he gave almost the same analysis. Neither one of us had any idea that the other was doing any of this stuff. Now, the difference between his and my, his analysis was much more elegant than mine. Uh, but I had real empirical data. <laughs> so I could relate it to human perception. So after it was over, Jan came up to me and he said, you know, we ought to collaborate. And um, you know, we worked together for 25 years, I think, until he finally retired and uh, dropped off the scene a little bit. But anyway, it was because of this problem that you know both of us were amazed that somebody else was weird enough to actually uh, think about it in this way. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't think this is a weird way of thinking. Once, once you get the insight, what can I get from two frames, then everything follows from that. You're just, you're just cranking out the math at that point. Um, and especially since I already had data and the data were perfectly consistent with the new analysis. All right, now having said that, one of the reasons why the paper was controversial is not all groups in the world were getting the same result. So there were a couple of other papers where um, people showed you got substantial improvements as you add more views. And so when that's the case, what do you have to do as a scientist? Try it their way. I'm sorry? Try it their way. And then you have to figure what is it about their way that's causing that result to take place. So that's what we had to do. So here's the, here's the relevant experiment. 
So suppose that I have an object, uh, this is two objects, I have a sphere, and the sphere could either be expanded in depth or compressed in depth. And you, the observer, have to decide, is it an expanded sphere or is it a compressed sphere? Now, it's important to understand when we do this, what is the ambiguity, what's the specific ambiguity in this scene where this object is rotating, uh, being viewed from that point of view? What's the one parameter family? Let me go back, because it's critical you understand this. So here's what they're getting. You have uh, you're getting X, Y, Z is defined by this, but there's a, there's a parameter that's being multiplied or divided, whichever way you want to think about it, times the Z term. All right, so the, you could be an object that's really expanded in depth that's rotating at a small velocity would produce exactly the same flow field as one that's compressed in depth and rotating at a fast velocity. So that's the ambiguity. It's a stretch along the line of sight. So let's take this observer, and we have a stretch version of the sphere. We have a compressed version of the sphere. Are those two objects ambiguous for this observer with two-frame apparent motion? I see a nod. Anybody think they're not ambiguous? All right, now here's the key to understanding this experiment. So suppose I start this thing rotating. Or we could have the observer rotate rather than the object. It would work just as well. When the observer gets up here, now are these two things ambiguous? Why do you say no? Because it's, you'll be able to see the, the top of it. And if it's like this, or like that. Well, it's not a stretch along this line of sight. It's a stretch along a different axis. So suppose you run this experiment, and um, you have two views from this position, or you have eight views where you see it rotate like so, you're going to get big improvement in performance because the flow fields aren't ambiguous from this view. So what's the right control to demonstrate that? What do you think? So is it the number of views that's causing the increase in performance or is it the particular viewpoint that's causing the increase in performance? So the way to test that would be two views from here, two views from here, and then say eight views where you get everything in between. Everybody fo follow the logic of that. So two views of here, these shapes are ambiguous. Two views from here, they're not ambiguous. If you have continuous motion from here to there, it starts out being ambiguous, but ends up not being ambiguous. Everybody tracking me so far? Here are the data. So this is the percent difference between the two spheres. So is it 10% stretched versus compressed? And uh, if you look at performance with eight frames or two frames slanted, that's these, subjects are doing fantastic. But if you have two views from this perspective, they're absolutely clueless. All right, so this is what was the difference between the experiments that were getting different results from mine. And that is, if you're gonna compare two versus multi-views, you've got to compare all possible two-view combinations within the multi-view set. And the other researchers didn't do that. So it really does look like observers are just using two views, which is fine if the shapes they're trying to distinguish are not ambiguous 
within the, the family for those two views. But if they are ambiguous within the family of those two views, they're going to have problems. Now here's one of my favorite experiments of all time. Tell me what you see here. Uh, like a knot or like, um, yeah, like in a continuous uh, knot shape. Knot's fine. And what's the knot doing? Uh, it's rotating along vertical axis. And is it rotating at a constant velocity? Uh, hard to tell. Doesn't look like it's speeding up and slowing down? How many think it's speeding up and slowing down? How many think it's constant? All right, this is, a, this is a crucial point here. Now, let's try and analyze this situation. What kind of thing could produce what you're seeing here? It could be a knot that's rotating in depth. Would do it? Well, suppose I did the following, though. Suppose I had a knot that was rotating in depth, and while it's rotating, I expand it and contract it in depth while it's going along. So it's non-rigid as hell. But all the changes are happening in that ambiguous family, which you can't distinguish between. So let's see how that works. So here we have the following case. This is the front view. This is what I showed you before. And this is what it looks like from the top. And you see how it speeds up and slows down while it rotates. And this is what it looks like from the front. Now contrast that with this case. Looks exactly the same from the front. But this is what it's actually doing seen from the top. It's like distorting like crazy. But all the distortions are within that ambiguous one parameter family that you can't see. So again, powerful source of information or powerful data to show that um, this notion of there is a, a family of shapes that are mathematically plausible uh, and somehow you pick one. Yeah. This might be like a stretch, but is that a pun? Mean, what? Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> unintentional. Um, does this have anything to do with conservation of angular momentum? Where if, if I'm spinning and I'm stretching, I'm going to speed up and slow down based on? Um, probably not. Okay. Um, but which which one is more likely in the real world? This or that? The first one. Yeah, from a, from a statistical perspective, there's no contest. Uh, you see this kind of thing a lot, and I venture to say you've never, never seen anything like that. If you did, it would totally blow you away. Um, yeah? So how, how are you getting the front view from the top view? Like, I'm sorry? I'm not, I'm not totally tracking you on how you're getting the front view from Okay, put a camera right in front of you, pointing at me. That's the front view. Now put a camera on the ceiling, pointing at me. That's what the top view does. Right, yeah, I understand that, but like, the one looks, like top, the top view looks very flat, like, one-dimensional versus two-dimensional. Uh, yeah, well, this is not a particularly powerful texture gradient. So you don't have a lot of information about depth in this view. You do here because you have the motion. Yeah? So if the front view was like still, we, would be able to, we wouldn't be able to see it. I'm sorry? If the front view was still, we wouldn't be able to see 3D shape. Um, not nearly as compellingly as you do here. Unfortunately, I can't stop this video, so 
I can't show you that, but um, I mean, you'd be able to see some 3D shape. Um, well, I'm really not getting much there. So it would, it, the only information would be from the occlusion and the texture gradients. And the texture gradients, if you look, are not that strong. But yeah, that's, if you saw it in a static view, that's where it would come from. You have a question? All right, again, the model predicts this because you have this ambiguous one parameter family. So if you're changing the shape of the object within that ambiguous realm, you have no real way of detecting that. It has to be an ambiguous figure? It has, it has to be an ambiguous figure? Uh, no, the, I don't think the figure's ambiguous. It, it's just the... I mean, I've done this with all manner, you know, a bust of a person, um, uh, cubes. I've used all sorts of objects with this. Uh, I just picked this one for the demo because I like it, but it works with any object. Lots of my colleagues just refuse to believe this. this, this that's not possible. Um, but it is. All right, let's do a little more math that um, I'll try to walk you through here. There are more predictions of the model. So for a moving surface defined by this form, remember I talked about this in an earlier lecture. This is called a Monge surface. It's named after the French mathematician Gaspard Monge. So it's one way of describing the shape of a surface. And it's a particular convenient way uh, to do differential geometry. Um, these things here, this notation, so little fx uh, refers to how quickly depth is changing in the x direction. Fy is how quickly depth is changing in the y direction. All right? So this is the derivative of f in the x direction. And then you have the second derivatives here. Uh, now it turns out to be the case that if any ratio of these two things is specified by the two frame apparent motion, and the reason for this is really simple. Let me go back. To here. Right, so suppose if you divide one thing that has this omega term in it by another thing that has the same omega term in it, then that unknown free parameter just goes away. And now the, the ratio is well specified with things you can measure in the image. Uh, but if that ratio, if you, if, as long as that omega is there, then you've got a one parameter family of uh, unknown of alternative possibilities. So here's the idea. What the theory says, if I ask observers to judge anything that involves a ratio of these things, they should be good at it. But if you can't describe it as a ratio of those things, then they won't be good at it. And I'll give you some examples. So let's consider this one. We talked about this before, uh, where we're representing surface orientation. And um, there are a couple ways we could do this. We could have the derivative of depth with respect to y, which would be this, and the derivative of depth with respect to x, which would be that. Now you can change the coordinates and do this in terms of tilt versus slant. And it turns out that tilt is very well specified with just two frames of apparent motion. Slant is not. So let's now do the following experiment. So in this study, what we did is the subjects looked at something that looked like this. So it's a dihedral angle. And um, they had a stereogram of a dihedral angle on another monitor. And what they had to do is adjust the stereogram so that the shape is the same as what they're seeing in the motion display. 
Now, the thing that they're adjusting here, by the way, is not slant and tilt. You have to convert their adjustments after the fact into that uh, coordinate framework. But if you do that, and you look at the tilt component of their adjustment, you get that. Almost perfect. I think correlation there is 0 0.98, 0 0.97, something like that. Kind of thing you would never see in social psychology, but you can get in perception. <laughs> All right, so this is the tilt parameter. Remember, tilt parameter is specified by two frame motion. Slant parameter isn't. So how does the slant judgments look? Like that basically random noise. Now these are the same data, right? So the subjects are adjusting these things and we're just converting whatever they adjusted into slant and tilt. And it turns out that, you know, all the tilt judgments fall in this wonderful straight line and all the slant judgments are like randomly distributed. And if you look at the, um, the correlations, so the, the tilt stuff, R squared between 0.8 and 1. Notice who the best subject here is, has initials JT. Um, but, uh, but then if you look at slant, um, they're, they're pretty clueless about it. So again, this is another source of information that is supporting the affine model. So the affine model saying some things we should be really good judging and some things we should be really crappy at judging. And the model predicts those things pretty accurately. Now we can do the same thing in the second derivatives if we're looking at curvature. So remember I told you before we can break curvature down in what's called k min and k max. This is the the, the largest curvature, so if you measure curvature in all directions from a given point, the direction that has the most curvature we'll call k max, the direction that has the smallest curvature we'll call k min, and another theorem by Euler proved that they're always at 90 degree angles. Um, we can reparameterize that in terms of what's called shape characteristic and curvedness, which is this out here, and it turns out that the S parameter you can define by a ratio of the second derivative, so the omega term goes away, but the curvedness parameter you can't. So what the model predicts is you should be really good at judging shape index and not so good at judging curvedness. So here's an example. This is a positively curved surface. It looks like a bump. Same task as the earlier one. Observers look at this, they have a stereogram on another screen that they have to adjust to match the shape. Here's another example with a saddle shape, like so. All right, so the difference between the bump and the saddle is um, the shape index parameter. So that's well specified. What's not well specified is the specific magnitudes of curvatures on these things. And here are the data for the shape characteristic. Almost perfect correlation. Here are the data for the curvedness. Much noisier. Here are the R squared values. So all the subjects here are perfect for shape characteristic and not very good at all for the curvedness. <coughs> so again, one more example after the other. What the model is telling us, some things you ought to be good at judging if they're affine invariant some things you should not be good at judging, if they're not. 
And the results from several experiments are confirming that that is indeed the case. Any questions about this whole story before I move on? All right, so let me just summarize the main points. So the main points are, you've got a theory by Ullman that says you can get metric structure perfectly with three views. The data show people don't use three views. Whatever they're doing, they're only using two. I then introduced a different analysis where you show, well, from two views, you can get most of the structure. You can get all the affine properties from two views. Um, but you can't get the metric structure from two views, as Ullman said. From that, the prediction is that some things that are invariant under affine transformations, like planarity or um, tilt or um, shape index, uh, you should be able to get from two view parent motion sequences. The data show, observers are really good at those things. Other properties, like relative 2D length, I'm sorry, relative 3D length, or um, curvedness, or slant, uh, the theory predicts we shouldn't be good at them. And lo and behold, the data show that observers uh, are not good at making those judgments. So the two-frame model seems to, to really hold up well here. Now, I wish, you could, I wish I could say that everybody in the field accepts this. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Again, they don't want to hear nothing about no affine geometry. But uh, I think it's a good model, and there's a, there's a whole lot of data to support it. Um, now, there are some things that this model can't do, cannot do. Like there are a whole lot of things that the model can't do. Uh, and this is going to lead me to a, a slide that we talked about earlier with the different kinds of contours. It turns out different, you know, so like specular highlight, shadows, uh, texture on surfaces, um, corners, those kinds of things. Uh, they don't all move in the same way when, it, when an object moves through space. Uh, and it turns out that um, the models that I've been describing are defined specifically for surface texture in terms of uh, reflective contours or uh, corners on an object. So those are the two main things that these models are referred to. And the reason for that is because of a basic property. So let's say you're looking at um, can I borrow your notebook? Let's say we're looking at her notebook and I move it through space. And you see this vertex right here at the corner? It doesn't matter where I am, where this thing is looking, that vertex is always the same point on the object. And that's the key for these models to work. In other words, you see a bunch of features, and the features always correspond to the same point on the surface. Now, let's consider a different kind of contour, an occlusion boundary. All right, so you're looking at my face. Where is the occlusion boundary? It goes like so. All right, so this is the locus of points that defines the occlusion. Where is it now? It goes like this. So as I move, the occlusion boundary is moving over the surface, not like the corner. Right? When, the co when the notebook moves, the corner is always at the same point on the surface. But the occlusion boundary changes with the direction of view. So if you try to apply the models that I just told you about, either Ullman's or mine, to the motions of an occlusion boundary, you're going to get random nonsense. Specular highlights do the same thing. We've talked about that when I mentioned specular highlights. You look at them from different positions, they change. 
shadows are the same way. So, um, yeah, let's do this. So they behave somewhat like occlusion boundaries, right? So this is a, a shadow. It moves over the surface as I move. So let's look at an inventory of all the different kinds of contours and um, see what the models apply to. <coughs> so we've got reflectance contours, corners, cast shadows, um, diffuse shading, specular shading, and smooth occlusions. And let's also distinguish between observer motion and object motion. So the, the two models that I gave you before, the Ullman's three-view model and my two-view model, they work in all these situations. So for reflectance contours and corners, they work for both observer motion and object motion. Cast shadows and, and diffuse shading only work with observer motion. So can somebody tell me why that might be the case? What's the difference between observer motion and object motion with respect to shadows? Can you all see the shadow right here? All right. When you move around, does the shadow move on the surface? Sakila, could you move your chair a bit? Just rotate it a little bit. Now did the shadow move? Yeah. All right. So here's an example where if the object moves, it changes the shadow. But if the observer moves, it doesn't change the shadow. I was at a big meeting in Europe one time and they had um, one of the absolute top um, guys who studies um, uh, sort of using flow to control the movement of cars. And so he had one of the very first analyses of optic flow and gave this ridiculously complex talk with, you know, equations a mile long. And um, so I was talking the next day and um, I went up to him. So he was applying it just to the shading that you see in, in the environment. It didn't require that you had identifiable features. It was just working off the shading. Um, and so I went up to him and I said, uh, and I just want to be clear before I give my talk tomorrow that your model assumes that the observer is moving and it won't work if the objects in the scene are moving. And he says, oh no, they're, they're perfectly invertible. And I said, well, yeah, but consider a shadow, right? If the object moves, the shadow changes and if the observer moves, it doesn't. He thought for a second and he said, oh, you're right. Um, so I, I derived two things about this guy from, I think his name was, you know, hair doctor professor, somebody's one of these German professors with 10 titles. But uh, so two things, A, he was really smart because I gave this example off the cuff and he immediately got it, which impressed me. Uh, but the other thing is, it was obvious he'd never thought about it, <laughs> which I found a little bit weird. Uh, but in any event, that's the problem. There, there are all kinds of motions where your traditional models aren't going to work. And um, so what is it you do as a scientist in that situation? What should be the first thing you want to study? Look at all those cases which are completely anomalous to the existing theories, even like my own. Um, you know, a lot of modelers don't want to do that. They only want to test the cases where their models are successful. But um, uh, we'll look at some of the cases here. So these are the ones that work. Uh, these are all cases that don't work. And let me show you some examples of them. Uh, well, here's one. So let's say this is what you're looking at on a display screen. And I have a single point on the occlusion boundary. Um, so here's the point on the occlusion boundary um, when it's in this orientation and it's going to rotate around to this orientation. 
And if you notice, the occlusion boundary is going to move outward, but the point's going to move inward. So what that's showing is that uh, a point on the boundary is doing something very different from the boundary itself. And this is diffuse and specular shading. Uh, so if the observer moves, the diffuse shading doesn't change at all. The specular change shading does. Uh, if the object moves, they both change. So here are some of the cases we looked at. Um, this is occlusion boundary by itself. This is the occlusion boundary with some texture on it. This is the occlusion boundary with specular highlights. This is the occlusion boundary with diffuse shading. Uh, now we're going to create some animations of these things. The task we did was a shape discrimination task. So we have uh, a standard shape, like so. And then we have, um, uh, it's a match to sample task. So you see standard shape, and then you see two other shapes. And you have to decide which one was the same as the first one that you saw. And then we're systematically distorting the foil so it can be closer or more different from the standard shape to find just the threshold. And so if we do that distortion, here's what it looks like from the front. Here's what we're actually doing from the top. OK, here's one with texture. This is perfect stimulus for the Ullman model or my model. You get nice 3D structure for motion on here. Here we had shading. Not hurt. You got all that texture to work with, so that's still giving you really good structure for motion. Here we have diffuse shading, but the object is moving. So notice that um, this is bright in one view and then gets darker. So I guess this is a better example. So in this orientation is bright, and that orientation is dark. All right, that totally blows up the structure for motion model. You just can't have that. But yet you see 3D form pretty well here. Here's adding specular highlights. You see how they hang on the high curvature and then they sort of shoot across the flat regions. This is uh, the occlusion boundary with the highlight on its own. Again, this is completely analogous, uh, anomalous. I don't know any models that can deal with that. Here's the occlusion boundary by itself. How many of you can see this as a 3D rigid motion? Some people can, some people can't. And this is my personal favorite, just the highlights by themselves. You see the object rotating. Now, for most of this stuff, there's no theory that can account for this. Um, so here's what the data look like. We ran two conditions, one with uh, single images and one with multiple images. The multiple images could be either uh, stereo. Oh, no, I guess we didn't use stereo here. It's uh, motion. Uh, multiple images means motion. Um, here are the cases the subjects have trouble with. So this is the shape discrimination threshold. The higher this is, the worse their performance is. And so the bad cases are texture and occlusions without any motion, or occlusions by themselves, either with or without motion. And pretty much all the other cases, they do great. And what that means is, um, so the models that we have only work for the texture and corners, and there are no corners in these stimuli. But somehow, the observers are able to make sense about all those other features. How they do it, I haven't the slightest idea. Um, but they do. And you would probably expect that, because all these features are fairly common in the natural environment. I mean, you see specular highlights all the time. We see shadows all the time. We see occlusion boundaries all the time. Uh, but they don't play well with motion models. Uh, but somehow people are able to make sense of it. So I think, uh, I know, 
I will quit here. This has been a fairly dense lecture, so I'll let you out early. And um, uh, the next two lectures will focus on uh, binocular vision. So have a good weekend.